Welcome back to Discrete Differential Geometry. Today we're going to introduce the idea of k-forms. And k-forms are all about measurement. Measurement is really fundamental to geometry. In fact, the word geometry means to measure the Earth. And so understanding measurement is going to help us not only understand how to acquire data, but what we can really say meaningfully about discrete data once we have it. Just to give a little bit of an overview, last time we introduced exterior algebra, which is a language that lets us build up and talk about little volumes or k-vectors. And there we had two basic operations. We had the wedge product that we use to wedge together vectors and build up volumes. And we had the Hodge star, which let us specify a volume by its complement. Where we're headed next is to define exterior calculus. So we want to know how do lengths and areas and volumes change over curved surfaces? To talk about change, we'll need to be able to measure change, right? And exterior calculus is going to be our essential language for talking about geometry and also for connecting geometry to physics. So today in particular, we'll talk about how to measure little volumes. And the key idea is, well, little volumes are going to be measured by other little volumes. And we're going to call such volumes k-forms. So let's just think for a moment about the whole idea of measurement. And a really interesting observation we can make is that measurement devices typically have the same dimension as the thing they're measuring. So for example, to measure length, we might use something one-dimensional like a ruler or a string. To measure volume, we might use something three-dimensional like a liquid measure, and so on. This same idea shows up in linear algebra. If we have a one-dimensional vector, we can kind of pair it with another one-dimensional vector using the inner product to get a measurement of that vector along some direction. And exterior calculus will generalize this idea to higher dimensional volumes. A k-dimensional volume will get paired with a dual k-dimensional volume to get a measurement. Okay. So for simplicity, we're going to start talking about all these ideas in flat spaces, in Euclidean Rn. And for a while, it might seem like we're saying a lot of kind of redundant stuff. Pairing vectors and dual vectors won't look any different from taking an inner product. Generally speaking, a lot of the ideas that we'll introduce about k-forms, you'll think, boy, this sounds an awful lot like k-vectors. Right? So why are we introducing this whole other set of things? And the reason is that once we start talking about curved spaces, things are going to get a whole lot more interesting. So, for instance, bending the plane into a surface, into a curved surface, is going to give us an inner product that actually changes from point to point, something called a Riemannian metric. And this whole language of exterior calculus and the duality between k-vectors and k-forms is going to help us incorporate this bending or this Riemannian metric into our calculations in a very nice systematic way where we can be sure that we're doing the right thing. Okay, so let's start out just in one dimension by talking about vectors and covectors. Okay, so there's a duality between vectors and covectors. What do I mean by duality? Duality is a pervasive idea in mathematics and, and even more broadly in philosophy. You have two sets of objects that are kind of in correspondence with each other but play complementary roles, sort of the yin and the yang. In geometry and exterior calculus, there's an important duality between vectors and covectors. So the really basic important idea here is that covectors should be thought of objects that do measurement. They're like your ruler. Whereas vectors are objects that get measured. They're the kind of length that you're measuring with your ruler. Okay, so covectors are kind of the dominant thing. Vectors are the subordinate thing. By the way, to make this distinction clear throughout the next couple of lectures, I'm going to draw the primal objects in blue, like vectors, and the dual objects in red, like the covectors. 
just as we wedged together vectors to get k vectors, we're going to wedge together covectors to get k forms, which are then dual to k vectors. Okay. So if this is all sounding, again, a bit redundant, it may be useful to realize that you have exactly this kind of duality in a much more familiar setting of matrix algebra. So when you work with matrices, you often make a very clear distinction between row vectors and column vectors. And both of these are just lists of numbers, right? I could have a row vector alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, or a column vector u1, u2, u3. And you might say, well, why make a distinction? Why do we have rows? Why do we have columns? Do you think that this is unnecessary? Does this actually not provide any value? Well, actually, you may remember there are some good reasons for having row versus column vectors. For one thing, it kind of indicates what it is that we're trying to do with these objects. We don't just want them to be sitting next to each other, but we're really saying, okay, please combine these two objects in some way to produce a value. Right? By taking advantage of the matrix product, we're going to actually do a dot product or an inner product of these two vectors. We can also interpret these a little more geometrically by thinking of the row vector as a linear map that sends the column vector to a real value. Right? So for any given column vector, it's going to get sent to the inner product with that row vector. Is this distinction useful? Yeah, I think so. And we're going to have a similar kind of duality between vectors and covectors. Okay? So let's say here alpha is a covector that has unit magnitude, and u is just a vector of any magnitude. What is the idea? What is the relationship between alpha and u? Well, the key idea is that a covector is going to measure the length of a vector along a particular direction. And because there's this kind of functional relationship, okay, the covector takes a vector as input and produces a length as an output, we write it in this kind of functional notation, alpha of u. Right? So we really think of a alpha as a function operating on vectors. A little more precisely, we could say let v be any real vector space. Then the dual vector space v star is the collection of all linear functions, alpha, from v to the reals, together with the operations of addition and scalar multiplication. Okay, meaning how do we add two functions alpha and beta? Well, to apply the function named alpha plus beta to a, to a vector u, we apply alpha to u, we apply beta to u, and we add the results. Similarly, what is the function named c alpha mean, if c is a constant, it just means evaluate the function alpha on the vector u and then multiply by c. Okay? So this is true for all alpha and beta in v star, all u in v, and all c in r. Okay, so then an element of this dual vector space is called a dual vector or a covector. So not at all different from what we were talking about with rows and columns. Right? We're going to think of a dual vector as a map that takes a vector's input and spits out a scalar as output. Okay. By the way, this notion of duality is unrelated to the Hodge star or the Hodge dual. Okay. There are a lot of different notions of duality that show up in geometry and mathematics more broadly. These are two distinct concepts. Here's a concrete example. Let's consider the vector space R3. And remember, what does it mean for a map to be linear? So a map F is linear if for all vectors u and v and scalars a, we have a couple things. F of u plus v is equal to F of u plus F of v, and F of au is equal to a f of u. Question, important question. What's an example of a linear map from R3 to R? So suppose, for instance, we have vectors expressed in coordinates, so vector u has coordinates x, y, z. Can you give just one example of a linear map f that takes u as input and gives just a single number as output? 
Well, one of many possible examples is to say f of x, y, z is equal to x plus 2y plus 3z. Okay, nothing special about this example. What are all the possibilities? What are all the possible linear maps from x, y, z to a number? Well, guess what? They all just look like the same function, but with different constants, right? f of x, y, z is equal to ax plus by plus cz for constants a, b, c. Okay, so we started out with a fairly abstract idea. The dual vector space is the space of all functions from vectors into the reals. And we end up with something pretty concrete, right? A dual vector can just be represented as, well, a list of numbers, kind of like a, a row vector. Okay, So in other words, in Euclidean R3, a covector just looks like another three vector with an important distinction that a covector always takes a vector as input and spits out a number as output. Okay, but you still might say, you know, what's the big fuss? Like, why are you making such a big deal about the difference between a vector and a covector? They really do both just sound like lists of numbers. So here's a more interesting example. So, this time we're going to look at a vector space that's very different from the ones we've looked at so far. In particular, we're going to look at real-valued functions on the unit interval that have a well-defined integral. Okay, so let's, let's just pause here for a second. What is going on? This doesn't sound like a, a vector space, right? These aren't little arrows. Well, actually, they are. So I can take any two such functions. I can add them together. I'll get another function on the unit interval that integrates. I can scale it by a number. I can do all the things with these functions that I can do with vectors. So why shouldn't I call them vectors? And if you go back to our definition from the last lecture of what a vector space is, this is a perfectly good vector space. Okay? So now the really interesting question is, what do the dual vectors look like? What does the dual vector space look like? We said dual vectors are linear maps from vectors into the reals. If you hand me a whole function f of x, like this blue bump or this green squiggly function or whatever, how can I take such a function and turn it into a number? Well, there's different ways I could do it. Here's one example. There's a function phi that's going to take an element of v, meaning just a, a whole function, f of x, and turn it into a number by integrating that function over the interval. Okay, that's a dual vector. That's a covector. Another example is delta, which takes, again, a function, f of x, and turns it into a number by just extracting the value of that function at zero. This is what's called the Dirac delta. Okay, so is via vector space, okay, you can look through the details and confirm that yes, it is. Are phi and delta covectors? Sure. We have to check linearity, right? If I take the sum of two functions, f and g, is the integral of the sum the sum of the integrals? Sure. If I extract the values at zero and add them up, is that the same as adding up the functions and extracting the value at zero? Sure. Okay. So this is a much more interesting example of a vector space and a dual vector space. And it's no longer really the case that these can be represented as functions from V, right? This Dirac delta is really not a function. So the dual vectors are very different from the, from the vectors if we go to this more general case. Okay. So the key idea is that the difference between primal and dual vectors can get really interesting. It's not a completely superficial distinction. For now, just to keep things simple, we're going to stick with vectors in Rn. Okay. So another thing that we're familiar with from linear algebra is the idea of a transpose. Right? So if I have two vectors, u and v, I can't multiply them directly. I don't know, because of some rule about dimensions of matrices. If I wanted to take a inner product between these two vectors, I would have to transpose the first one. So I could transpose u. Now I get a row vector that I can multiply by 
Okay. With vectors and covectors, I have an analogous idea. Let's say I have two vectors, u and v. Well, I can't apply one to the other, right? They're both vectors, neither is a function. But what I can do is I can take the flat of one of the vectors, let's say u, and then I can apply u flat to v. Likewise, if I have two covectors, alpha and beta, I can apply the sharp, maybe to beta, and then I can apply alpha to beta sharp. Okay, so just like the transpose, but I have a specific word for going from vectors to covectors versus covectors to vectors. By the way, these sharp and flat operations come from music, right, where they're kind of opposite operations, raising or lowering the pitch by a half step. Why are we using these musical symbols? We'll see a bit later on that these are actually very uh, <laughs> well-justified choices. Okay. So, again, it seems like much ado about nothing. We had this very simple idea of a transpose. Why are we turning it into sharp and flat and making a big fuss about this? Well, things get a lot more interesting if our inner product is something other than the trivial dot product. So, in general, if I want to take the inner product between two vectors, I can stick in the middle a inner product matrix, or what's sometimes called a mass matrix. So this is a positive definite matrix that gives me some notion of what does angle mean in the space that I'm working in. Okay, If I call that matrix M, then I could write in matrix notation this U flat operation as actually doing U transpose M V. Right? So taking the flat of u doesn't simply take the transpose of u, but it takes the transpose of u and then post multiplies it by this mass matrix M. Likewise, the sharp operation doesn't merely transpose beta, but it actually transposes beta and multiplies it by the inverse of the mass matrix. Okay, so you really start to get a sense that there's something deeper about this distinction between vectors and covectors than just flipping a column vector over on its side. Right? This mass matrix, when we start talking about curve geometry, is going to make sure that we're really measuring and talking about the right quantities when we go between flat and curved spaces. By the way, another way we could write this if we want to avoid the matrix notation is we could say u flat is a function that takes as input a vector and what does it do? Well, it does the same thing as taking the inner product of the vector u with the argument. Likewise, we could say that taking the inner product with the vector alpha sharp is the same as applying the function or the covector alpha. Okay. So again, the basic idea is that applying the flat of a vector is the same as taking the inner product. Taking the inner product with the sharp is the same as applying the original covector. Okay, so we have a pretty good handle now on taking measurements of vectors. Let's now talk about how we take measurements of little volumes, these k vectors that we introduced in our previous lecture. So just to recap, up until this point, we've studied two distinct concepts. So we can start with an ordinary vector space, and we can kind of go two directions. One thing we can do is we can take vectors, and we can use them to build up little volumes by taking wedge products. Right? And this is this idea of going from vectors in linear algebra to k vectors in this more general exterior algebra. Another direction we can go is to take that same vector space and look at its dual vector space. So we can define the covectors as the set of linear maps from vectors to scalars. Right? These are completely independent concepts up to this point. What we're going to do now is combine these ideas. How do I take measurements of k vectors? How do I wedge together covectors to get such measurements? This is going to give us what we call k forms. So just as a covector measures a vector, a k form will measure a k vector. In particular, just as covectors take linear measurements of vectors, K forms will take multilinear measurements of K vectors, okay, meaning they'll be linear with respect to each individual vector. Okay, so when we talk about just vectors, 
geometrically, what does it mean to take a linear measurement of a vector? Our, our observation is that the only thing you can really measure about a vector in a linear way is, is it, its extent along some direction. I could ask this blue vector u, how far does it point along the direction alpha? Okay. Concretely, how do we take that measurement? Well, if alpha is a unit vector and we want to know the extent of u along alpha, we would just take a dot product. We would just sum up the components of alpha times the components of u. And as we mentioned before, since we think of u as the vector getting measured and alpha as the co-vector doing the measurement, we can write this as a function application, alpha of u. We can, of course, apply the same function when alpha does not have unit length, right? I can still always write the same sum and define that to be the meaning of alpha of u. Alpha of u is the sum over all components i of alpha i ui. What's the interpretation now? If alpha doesn't have unit length, what does this operation mean? Well, one way to think about it is we're going to take the projected length, how far does u point along the unit direction alpha, and then just multiply by the magnitude of alpha. Okay, not too hard to understand. So now let's go up in degree. And to make sense of what this means for general k vectors, it's going to be really important to review the concept of determinants and signed volume, another concept from linear algebra. So what is the determinant? I think a lot of people get a description of the determinant, which is something like, oh, well, if you have a matrix, then there's a little algorithm that you run through to compute the determinant. You kind of recursively compute subdeterminants and then take an alternating sum. Okay, this is correct, but it's really not helpful in understanding what a determinant means. So from here on out, whenever you hear the determinant, I want you to really think about volume. More precisely, something about signed volume, meaning that if we flip orientation, the sign of this volume is going to change. Okay, so what, so what do I mean? Let's think, for instance, in 2D. Okay, in 2D, if I have a pair of vectors, u and v, sitting in a plane, I can get the area of the parallelogram defined by these two vectors by taking sort of a cross product u1, v2, minus u2, v1. Okay? Why do I call that assigned area? Well, if I do this in the opposite order, if I do v cross u, I get v1, u2, minus v2, u1. These two expressions have the same magnitude, but they have different sign, which means one of them must be the area, the positive area in the usual sense, and the other one must be minus that area. And what does the minus sign tell us? It just tells us how is this parallelogram oriented relative to the plane? Okay. More generally, the determinant of a collection of vectors v1 through vn is the signed volume of the parallel piped defined by these vectors. So, for instance, if I have a matrix A, 3 by 3 matrix A, with columns v1, v2, v3, and I think of those column vectors as the sides of a parallel piped in 3D, then the determinant of this matrix is exactly the same as the volume of this parallel piped. Okay? But if I swap two of the vectors, the sign is going to change. The orientation of the volume is going to change. Okay? So, with that all in mind, what does it mean to take a measurement of a two vector, a multilinear measurement of a two vector? And really the right picture is that we're going to think about the size of sort of the shadow of one parallelogram on another. Okay, so let's say I have this blue parallelogram and I have this red parallelogram. And if they both sit at the same origin, right, then I can kind of think about what is the area of the projection of the blue parallelogram on the red one. All right, let's work that out in a little bit more detail. So how do we compute this projected area? How do we compute the projected area of a parallelogram uv onto a plane? 
Well, what we could do is we could pick any orthonormal basis, alpha, beta, for this plane. We could project the two vectors u and v onto this plane. And then we could apply the standard formula for area using the cross product. More specifically, the projection would look like this. I'd take the vector u. And to get the two components in the projection, then I could take a dot product. Or if I think of alpha and beta as covectors, I do alpha of u and beta of u. That just gives me the extent of u along the alpha and beta directions. Likewise, to project v, I would do alpha of v, beta of v. I'd get the extent of v along the alpha and beta directions. OK, so now I have coordinates, 2D coordinates, for the projection in this red plane. How do I compute the area? Well, I just use the cross product. The cross product of two vectors in a plane gives me the area of that parallelogram. So I get alpha of u times beta of v minus alpha of v times beta of u. Sounds familiar. Right. More generally, we could, of course, apply this exact same expression when alpha and b are not orthonormal. And that is what we're going to define as applying a two form, alpha wedge b, to two vectors uv. And we're going to say alpha wedge beta of uv is defined as alpha of u times beta v minus alpha v times beta of u. And this defines the application of a two form to two vectors. What is the geometric interpretation? What does it mean to stick two vectors into a two form? Well, it's what we just said. We find the projected area onto this plane. And then we scale that projected area by the area of the parallelogram defined by alpha and beta. If alpha and beta get smaller, the result gets smaller. If alpha and beta get bigger, the result gets bigger. So if we play around with this definition a bit, we notice some important things. So one thing we notice is that exchanging the arguments of this two form reverses the sign. So if instead of applying alpha wedge beta to uv, we apply it to vu, what do we get? So we can just plug in the definition that we just had. So alpha wedge beta of vu is equal to alpha v beta u minus alpha u beta v. OK, and now just by putting a minus sign in the right place, we see that's minus alpha of u beta v minus alpha v beta u. Oh, but that's no different from minus alpha wedge beta of u v. Interesting. What does that mean geometrically? We observed it happens algebraically, but why does that make sense in terms of the pictures we've been drawing? Well, what's the difference between u v and v u? Right? u wedge v and v wedge u are the same parallelogram, except that they're oriented in two different directions. So what this anti-symmetry is kind of telling us is that when we measure this two vector using our two form, alpha wedge beta, we're trying to figure out not only how big is the shadow cast on the plane, but we're also trying to see what is the relative orientation of these two things. All right? In this case, does the blue parallelogram have a normal that points more or less in the same direction as the red parallelogram, or are they flipped in opposite, opposite directions. Okay. Another interesting thing is we have kind of another kind of anti-symmetry. Remember that exchanging the arguments to a wedge product also reverses the sign. So if we have beta wedge alpha of uv, then OK, we can again apply the definition and find that that's equal to beta of u alpha v minus beta v alpha of u. We stick a minus sign on the outside, and we get alpha v beta v minus alpha v beta u. And that is minus alpha wedge beta of u v. OK, so now what does this other anti-symmetry mean geometrically? All right, before we flipped u and v, now we flipped alpha and beta. Well, it means kind of the same thing. It's just saying, again, if we flip the red parallelogram over, right? then the relative orientation of the red and the blue parallelograms are going to be different. So this is all just reminding us that 
k vectors are oriented volumes and k forms are oriented volume measurements. So if we change the orientation of one of these things, the sign is going to flip. Okay, what if we keep going up in degree? So what does it mean geometrically to take a multilinear measurement of a three vector? Let's say we're in three dimensional space. Okay, so try to draw a picture here. Okay, I have a little blue volume. That's like my three vector and I have a little red box that's supposed to represent my three dimensional volume measurement. So one thing we can observe here is that in R3, all three vectors kind of have the same direction, right? I can take a plane in R3 and I can orient it lots of different ways, but I really only have one orientation for a volume in R3. And so the only thing we could possibly do is measure magnitude. The only thing I can measure about the blue thing is its magnitude. I can't really talk about its magnitude relative to the red thing, okay? More concretely, how would we compute the volume of a parallel piped with edges u, v, and w? Well, let's again take a basis. Take a basis alpha, beta, gamma. Assume this is orthonormal. To get the volume of the blue parallel piped, I could project these vectors, u, v, w, onto this basis. And then I could apply the standard formula for volume using the determinant. So how do I project the edges of this blue volume onto my basis? Well, I go ahead and I just measure u using alpha, using beta, using gamma. Likewise, I measure v and I measure w. I'm just getting the components of u, v, and w in the basis alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. What's the volume? The volume is then just what we said before. It's the determinant of a matrix that has these values in the columns. If you want, you can write this determinant out. And what you notice is it's kind of an alternating sum. I add up the even permutations of UVW and I subtract the odd permutations of UVW. Okay? So as we did with one forms and two forms, we can of course apply this same expression when alpha, beta, and gamma aren't an orthonormal basis, but they're just three sides of some other parallel pipette. If we do this, we get the definition of what it means to apply a three form to three vectors. Okay, and it's just that same alternating sum. What now does this application mean? What does it mean to measure three vectors by a three form. Well, it just means we're measuring the volume of the blue parallel pipette. We're just seeing how big that thing is. And then we're scaling it by the size of alpha, beta, gamma. If we scale up our three form by some constant factor, the measurement goes up by a constant factor. If we scale actually even one of these one forms, alpha, up by a constant, the result's going to go up by constant. So more generally, a k-form is a fully anti-symmetric multilinear measurement of a k-vector. Okay? Fully anti-symmetric meaning swapping any two of its arguments changes the sign. Multilinear means, well, it's linear if we just restrict it to a single argument. Typically, we're going to think of this as a map from k-vectors to a scalar, right? So a K form alpha is going to take K vectors as input and spit out a single number as output. Multilinear, again, means linear in each argument. So for instance, if we have a two form, that means that if we add or scale in the first argument, those additions and scalings can just get pulled out. If we have alpha of AU plus BV comma W, then we get A times alpha of UW plus B times alpha of VW. Likewise, if we do some linear operations in the second argument, those linear operations can get pulled out. Okay. Fully anti-symmetric means exchanging two arguments reverse signs. So for instance, for a three form, if we swap the arguments V and W, the result gets negated. 
And so in general, that means even permutations will maintain the same sign. Odd permutations will reverse the sign. You may now be thinking about our discussion of oriented simplicial complexes, the fact that permutations that are even preserve sign, permutations that are odd reverse sign, and that is not a coincidence. The reason we decided to work with oriented simplicial complexes will ultimately have to do with the fact that we want to capture k-forms which have this same kind of anti-symmetry. Okay, but we're not quite there yet. For three forms, we saw that we could express the application of a k-form via a determinant. And that again captures the fact that k-forms are measurements of volumes. So how does this work more generally? In general, if we want to apply a k-form to k-vectors, we're going to follow the same recipe. We're going to project our vectors onto a k-dimensional space defined by the k-form and measure volume there. So if we have a k-form defined by wedging together k covectors, so alpha 1, wedge alpha 2, wedge dot dot dot, wedge alpha k, applied to k vectors u1 dot 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 uk, then the measurement we get is just going to be the determinant of the vectors obtained by projecting those vectors u onto the covectors alpha. And the meaning is going to be the same as before. We're measuring the volume of the projection of the u's onto the basis defined by the alphas times the size of the volume defined by the alphas. Okay. So special case, when k is equal to 1, we're just taking the determinant of a matrix with a single entry, which is alpha 1 applied to u1. Right? In other words, we're just doing the usual idea of measuring a vector with a covector. When k is equal to 2, we're going to take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, and we get alpha 1 u1 times alpha 2 u2 minus alpha 1 u2 times alpha 2 u1. Okay, So just the size of the projected area times the size of alpha itself. This two-dimensional case, by the way, is a, a good formula to remember because we're going to use it all over the place in talking about the geometry of surfaces. Okay. By the way, a little note on notation. So all along we've been talking about how the whole idea of a k-form is to take a measurement of a k-vector. Right? A k-form is a measurement of a little k-dimensional volume. So you'd think it would be natural to use notation like this, to say, okay, we have a, let's say, a two-form, alpha wedge beta, and we're going to use that to measure a two-vector, u wedge v. However, for whatever historical reason, nobody writes it this way. Nobody writes the argument of a k-vector using a wedge. Instead, the convention is to do what we've been doing in these past few slides, and to just write a list of vectors as the argument. Okay, so we have a two form alpha wedge beta, and it's going to measure a pair of vectors u, v. Geometrically, it's doing the same thing. u and v <laughs> define a little two-dimensional volume, and alpha wedge beta is going to measure that two-dimensional volume. Okay, um, but we don't write the wedge in the arguments. I was a little tempted in designing this course to say, let's just do it. It makes a certain amount of sense. But I think the downside to that is that when you go off and start reading uh, differential geometry that you find essentially anywhere else in the world, now you're going to have this crazy notation that, that disagrees with what most people do. Okay. One nice thing actually about doing it this way is that you can at least infer something about type from notation. So if you see a wedge product, you can be very sure that you're talking about a k form and not a k vector. As is often true, we have a corner case to talk about. So what about zero forms? What is a zero form? Okay, well in general, we said a k form is something that takes k vectors as input and produces a scalar as output. And something that's supposed to be measuring a k-dimensional volume. So a zero form then must be something that takes no vectors as input and still produces a scalar as output. In other words, a zero form is a scalar. 
You don't have to give it anything and it will give you a scalar. It'll give you a number. So it basically looks like this. Right? You could imagine it's a dot of a certain size and the size is the magnitude of your scalar. Okay, so zero form does still have magnitude even though it only has one possible direction. Okay, so, so far we've talked about k-forms entirely without thinking about coordinates. And that's good, hopefully, because it should give you some geometric intuition for what these mean. K-forms are things that measure k-dimensional volumes. They're like your measuring cup that's being used to measure liquid. Okay. But if we actually want to calculate with these things, it is sometimes useful to be able to write them out in coordinates. So how do we do this? So this idea of measurement becomes very concrete once you have a coordinate system. For instance, if I have a vector v, then to measure all possible information about v, I could just measure it along each coordinate axis. So I could take a measurement along an axis e1 to get a, a coordinate v1. I could take a measurement along an axis e2 to get a coordinate v2. And then I can use these measurements to recover the vector v. I can take a weighted linear combination of the bases, v1 times e1 plus v2 times e2, to get back the vector v. Okay? So let's see how this works for k-forms. Right? So in an n-dimensional vector space v, we could express vectors in a basis e1 through en. That's the typical thing. The scalar values vi are the coordinates of v. Likewise, we can write covectors in a so-called dual basis, E1 through En, and you notice the difference is only, apart from the color, the only difference is that we now have superscripts rather than subscripts. And so this is the first time where this is going to start to be really important. Do we have subscripts or do we have superscripts? This is a notation that's going to help us keep things straight between vectors and covectors when we start working in coordinates. Okay, so we can write a covector alpha as alpha sub 1 e superscript 1 plus dot 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 plus alpha sub n e superscript n. These two bases for the vectors and the covectors, by the way, have a very special relationship. They're not just some arbitrary basis for the vectors and then some other arbitrary basis for the covectors, but rather if I measure the jth basis for the vectors in the ith basis for the covectors, then I'm going to get 1 if i and j are the same and 0 otherwise. Okay, So e superscript i is really the dual basis to e subscript j. That's again going to help to simplify a lot of our calculations. Just to remind ourselves what the difference between vectors and covectors are, what is E superscript I mean geometrically? What kind of object is it? What does it do? Okay, so just like any covector, E superscript I is a function that takes a vector's input and gives a number as output. What that means geometrically is it's measuring the given vector along the ith coordinate axis. Okay? So here's just a simple example in coordinates to help solidify understanding of some of these ideas. So let's start with a vector v and a one-form alpha in the plane. So v is equal to 2e subscript 1 plus 2e subscript 2. And alpha is equal to minus 2e superscript 1 plus 3e superscript 2. What then is alpha of v? How do I apply the covector alpha to the vector v? Okay, well, as usual, the first step is to just swap in the definition. So alpha of v is going to be the same as applying the function minus 2e1 plus 3e2 to the vector 2e1 plus 2e2. Okay, because these are linear functions, I can break it apart into two terms and just apply the function e1 to the vector 2e1 plus 2e2, 
multiply by negative 2. Then apply the function e2 to the vector 2e1 plus 2e2 and multiply by 3, and then add up the results. Okay, to take this yet a step further, I can again apply linearity, and this becomes minus 4 e superscript 1 applied to e subscript 1, minus 4 e superscript 1 applied to e subscript 2, plus 6 e superscript 2 applied to e subscript 1, plus 6 e superscript 2 applied to e subscript 2. Okay, at this moment, what we want to remember is that the bases for the covectors and the vectors are dual. What is the length of e subscript 1 along the direction e superscript 1? It's 1, right? The red e1 is saying, how far does this vector go along the first direction? And the answer is 1. What about e superscript 1 applied to e subscript 2? Well, that's just saying, if I have a vector in the vertical direction, how far does it point along the horizontal direction? And the answer is, it, not at all, 0. Right? So we can greatly simplify this expression here by replacing each of these terms with either 1 or 0. And we're left with minus 4 plus 6, okay, which hopefully you know is equal to 2. So this looks just like a dot product. Right? We did a lot of extra work and manipulation to take what ended up being just the dot product between two vectors. Okay, but the point of this exercise is to just get familiar with the notation. Here's a more interesting example. Let's consider the following vectors and covectors. So we have u, our first vector is 2e1 plus 2e2. Our second vector is minus 2e1 plus 2e2. Okay, and we have two covectors, alpha and beta, equal to e1 plus 3e2 and 2e1 plus e2. Okay, we then have, well, remember that alpha wedge beta of uv is alpha of u beta v minus alpha v beta u. Okay, and I would like to evaluate this expression for the given alpha, beta, u, and v. Right? I would like to apply, I would like to measure u and v using alpha wedge beta. How do I do this? Well, how about I just go one term at a time? So what is alpha of u? Right? How do I apply a covector to a vector? Well, as we just saw, at least in Rn, this just looks like a dot product. So I could just go ahead and write alpha of u is 1 times 2 plus 3 times 2 is equal to 8. Okay, beta v is well, some calculation that's equal to minus 2. Alpha v is 4. Beta of u is equal to 6. Okay, and now I have these four values, and now I just do ordinary arithmetic. 8 times minus 2 minus 4 times 6 is equal to minus 40. Great, so we did some calculation. What does it mean geometrically? What did we just do? This is kind of the point of the whole lesson. Like, what does it mean to apply a two-form to a pair of vectors? Well, remember, we started out talking by measurement. The whole idea is k forms are volume measurements. And what are they measuring? k vectors, which are volumes. Okay. In this case, both of these things live in the plane. And so we're just saying, how big is uv when projected onto the same plane as alpha wedge beta? Well, they're in the same plane, so uv keeps its size. And then the size of alpha wedge beta also comes into play. Right? The bigger the measuring device is, the bigger the result is. If we change sort of the units on our measurement, we get a bigger number. Okay. Why, in this case, is the result negative? That's also an important thing to understand. Why is it negative? Well, it's negative because they have different orientations. Right? So u wedge v sort of points out of the plane. Alpha wedge beta sort of points into the plane. And so this minus sign is just a single bit of information saying, hey, these things disagree in orientation. OK. So finally. Before we wrap up, I want to explain a little bit why are some of the indices up and other ones down. I mean, one reason for this is it helps us to keep track of which quantities we're talking about. Are we talking about the 
bases for vectors? Are we talking about the bases for covectors? If we're not writing things in red and blue, this becomes really hard to, to sort out. Um, but here's the other reason. This is the genesis of this notation. So we have this nice note that says, Ein Blick auf die Gleichungen dieses Paragraphen seit das Überindices die zweimal unter... Okay, so if you don't know German, and, and I definitely don't, then what this says is, this is a note on a simplified way of writing expressions by Albert Einstein. So he says, a look at the equations of this paragraph show that there's always a summation over indices which occur twice and only for twice repeated indices. It is therefore possible without detracting from clarity to omit the sum sign. For this, we introduce a rule. If an index in an expression appears twice, then the sum is implicitly taken over this index unless specifically noted to the contrary. So what is Einstein going on about? He's just saying, well, look, whenever I'm writing up my formulas, I keep on having to write this darn sum symbol over and over and over again with the same bounds. Every time it's the same. If I just put some of my indices up and some of my indices down, then I can just throw out this sum symbol and I just know that whenever I see the same index up and down, that there's a sum there over all possible values of that index. Okay, so this is a way of just making your expressions a little more concise. And we'll keep on writing the sums just to keep things clear. But you may find this useful in your own writing. And, and certainly when you go out and you start reading uh, other texts in differential geometry, this is going to show up all the time without any explanations. People will just drop this notation in and assume that you already know what it means. Okay. This notation also, by the way, finally explains why we used sharp and flat for our earlier operations, for our transpose-like operation. So why might that be the case? Well, what do sharp and flat do on a musical staff? Well, sharp is going to raise the pitch by a half step. Uh, right? And flat is going to lower the pitch by a half step. Uh, okay? Likewise, sharp and flat in exterior calculus are going to raise and lower indices of the coefficients for one forms and vectors. And so one forms are going to have indices below. And if we want to turn them into vectors, then we apply the sharp operation, which takes those lower indices and turns them into upper indices by moving them up, up the staff. If we have a vector, it's going to have indices up, and the flat operation is going to bring those indices down. So suppose, for instance, that alpha sharp is equal to u, and likewise u flat is equal to alpha, okay? Then let's say we've written alpha out in coordinates as alpha subscript 1 e superscript 1 plus alpha sub 2 e superscript 2 plus dot 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 alpha sub n e superscript n, then the sharp is going to be this vector u, which is u superscript 1 e subscript 1 plus dot 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 u superscript n e subscript n. Okay, so hopefully that demystifies that a little bit. These operations, by the way, are sometimes called the musical isomorphisms. Musical because we use the sharp and flat notation, and isomorphisms because they go between the, the two vector spaces of covectors and vectors without changing dimension. Okay. So hopefully you're not at this point too lost in notation and coordinates and these low-level details. The, the high-level point, the real thing to remember about this lecture is that a k-form is just a thing that measures a k-dimensional volume, much in the same way that a ruler is something that measures a one-dimensional length or a measuring cup is something that measures a three-dimensional volume. In our next lecture, we're going to take this one step further. So as you may remember from vector calculus, it's often useful to attach a vector to each point of a space to obtain a vector field. This is something that could describe maybe the velocity of a of fluid that's flowing around, or it could be the gradient of a scalar function, or all sorts of other things. Likewise, we'll see that it's useful to attach a k-form, a little volume measurement, to each point of space to obtain what we'll call a 
differential k form, something that takes measurements, different measurements at each point of space. Okay? But we'll talk about that next time. See you then.